good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you for coming to see and hear from Joni Cole. Uh, I'm Christian Prelaski. I'm one of the co-owners with my wife, Carrie, of the Yankee Bookshop here in town. Uh, tonight, Joni Cole will be in conversation with Liza Bernard about her newest book, a collection of essays called Party Like It's 2044, Finding the Funny and Life and Death. Before we get started, uh, we'd just like to take a moment to thank Norman Williams Public Library for hosting, being a place to gather, and all the work that they do for the community. And thank WCTV for filming and broadcasting these events, which can be found on their YouTube channel. Uh, Yankee Bookshop will be selling books afterwards, with a portion of sales going back to the Norman Williams Public Library. Uh, quick note, please remember to silence all phones and other devices. Uh, the format tonight will be an interview and discussion with some time afterwards for audience questions. Our guests tonight probably need no introduction <laughs> as they're both pivotal figures in our local literary community, serving readers and writers alike, helping to bring us all together through the power and passion of the written word. Interviewing Joni, we're honored to have Liza Bernard, Norman Williams Public Library's own programming and marketing librarian, events planner and organizer, book reviewer and spreader of the word. Uh, prior to joining the library, Liza was a bookseller and one of the founders, owners, and orchestrators of the esteemed Norwich Bookstore in Norwich, Vermont for the past three decades from 1994 until retiring in 2021. We are lucky to have her here sharing the knowledge and joy of books in our community. Joni Cole is a writing instructor, author of seven books, freelance writer, guest lecturer, and literary consultant where she served as program director of the Bookstock Literary Festival in 2022. Through her own Writer's Center and White River Junction, Joni has taught in person and online creative writing to adults for 25 years, and through workshops, retreats, and conferences around the country. She's written two books for writers, Good and Naked, How to Write More, Write Better and Be Happier, and Toxic Feedback, Helping Writers Survive and Thrive. Nominated for US Fellowship Award and Pushcart Prize, she created the the three-volume This Day series that shares a day diary in the life of hundreds of women across America. Joni works with aspiring and seasoned authors, guiding them through the creative process, helping them find their voice and bring their stories to life. Tonight, Joni will share some of her thoughts and stories with us, and we'll hear more about her latest book, Party Like It's 2044. Please join me in welcoming Liza Lamar <coughs> and Joni Cole. Thank you. Christian, thank you for that lovely introduction. Yeah, thanks. And Not thank you all said for you coming. Retired. Is this what retirement looks like? <laughs> <laughs> for some of us, yes. <laughs> um, do you want to start with giving us a little taste of the book? We, we talked about reading a short all passage, right. and then I'll jump right in with questions. Can everybody hear okay? Is the, is the microphone there? Does the speaker come out here? Yeah. Okay. I'm deaf. Okay. Turn up a little bit more. Many of us are. I have never um, actually read aloud at a book event the title essay. So I thought, why not give it a try tonight? It's just going to be a little taste, a little teaser. The title essay is Party Like It's 2044. My partner, Helmut Baer, did the illustrations that precede every one of the essays. So this is, I don't know if you have a copy of the book, but there's a fun illustration or sort of fun illustration before this book or this um, title essay. Party like it's 2044. I shuffled through the early February snow slush to my mailbox and the effort did not disappoint. There in the mix was what looked to be an early birthday card in a bright pink envelope along with an oversized flyer from a local car dealer advertising a blowout sale. Drive away today in a brand new Subaru. Also in the mix was a letter with the return address, the Cremation Society of Vermont. Back inside, I eagerly opened the pink card. Dear Joni, wrote one of my good friends, I know how much you love your birthday and it's quite refreshing, especially given our advanced years. The image on the card showed one of those wrinkled dogs. Jesus, I thought, if I was hoping for something more upbeat, I probably should have just opened the letter from the Cremation Society. This friend, however, got one thing right. I do love my birthday, and always have, minus the one with the red velvet cake incident, better left forgotten. 
but my friend's comment about our advanced age felt like a coffin dropping on my enthusiasm. And right when the arrival of my first birthday card should have marked the kickoff of my annual month-long celebration of my birth. Advanced years. I put the card on my windowsill, a nice reminder of my good friend and that I am nearing death. And by nearing death, as this card handily reminded me, we weren't talking about dying from a sudden illness or accident, but simply dying from old age. Plain old age, meaning if I dropped dead tomorrow, people would read my obituary and I hope feel horrible. But no one would be thinking, what a terrible tragedy, she died so young. Any other day I would have tossed the unsolicited letter from the Cremation Society of Vermont, but its arrival on the launch of my birthday month seemed suspiciously significant, an omen in the form of junk mail. Knock, knock. Who's there? The friendly folks at the Cremation Society, wishing you a happy birthday and also a bit of timely advice. Don't bother with Subaru's blowout sale. <laughs> I opened the letter, likely one of the first times I willingly stared the inevit inevitability of death, my death, head on. This was a luxury I was well aware. A number of my friends, several of them younger than me, have circumstances that have pressed this issue upon them, while I have merrily avoided things like deciding what to do with my remains. This has allowed me, emotionally speaking, to stay at the age where I am more focused on buying expensive age-defying creams, which would be a terrible investment if I was to think too hard about how little time I have left to let them work their wonders. <coughs> Dear informed consumer, the letter from the Cremation Society began. Back in my days as a copywriter, I used to write these types of marketing letters, so I was aware that even the deferential salutation was part of the soft sell, and the flattery worked. These people assumed I was informed, and this before they had told me a single thing about their services. It turned out the Cremation Society also understood the trouble I've seen. The death of a loved one is one of the hardest things a family has to face, the letter wrote. No argument there. So to help me prepare for this tragic circumstance, they assured me that they were here to give me peace of mind, whether I used their services on an as-needed basis or chose to become a member of their society. <coughs> the latter option intrigued me. Other than society at large, I had rarely claimed membership in any type of club or association. But would this be the type of club I would want to join? It seemed it might attract a bit of peculiar population. What kind of people opt to gather on a regular basis to talk about cremation and ashes rather than, say, go bowling or discuss their book club pick? And if I did join the Cremation Society of Vermont, would they send me a free toad or coffee mug like public radio provides its members? I really wouldn't want to be reminded of incinerated bodies every time I went shopping or sipped my coffee. Plus, exactly how many cremations would it take to amortize the cost of membership? The letter closed by encouraging me to complete the accompanying questionnaire. Thus far, the tone of the letter had been so comforting, so compelling, I found myself seeking a pen almost against my will. Yes, Cremation Society of Vermont, I imagined myself nodding in a zombie-like trance. I wish to be cremated, and I wish to pay in advance. Question one, what is your age? Question two, what is your annual income? Gone, just like that, was the caring overtone of the cover letter, knocked out by this one-two punch of hard numbers. Question three, have you ever been responsible for making cremation arrangements? I had not, which was obviously a blessing, but it also raised the question, why hadn't anyone in my family entrusted me with this issue? My dad had been cremated, but no one had consulted me. Maybe because he was still sending me money to help buy my daughters a few extra Christmas presents, even when I was well into my 40s. Question four, would you ever consider cremation for yourself? Sure, I thought, after I'm dead. No doubt the folks at the Cremation Society had heard this lame joke a million times before, but already I had lost my motivation for going down this responsible road. Why should I have to deal with such a heavy issue right at the start of my birthday month? Shouldn't birthdays be all about celebrating? 
I think I'll stop there. Thank you. So Joni and I met two decades ago <laughs> with, with the book that she created that Christian mentioned called This Day, which is actually part of a three book series where about 500 women um, had, had a day diary that they published and you got a whole range of different personal stories. And you've published, this is now your second book of very personal essays um, after Bad, Bad Dog Book, which was called Self-Aware and Edgy, Humor That Matters. And what I was wondering is what draws you to reveal all of those intimate moments, both of your, your own and, and others? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for mentioning that project. It was a three book series and women were so generous. 500 um, volunteers across the country for each book contributed a day diary where they recorded what they were doing but also thinking and feeling on a single day. And they were surprised by how revelatory they were. But you know, in the end, they were all willing to share. I think there's something really freeing when you share in writing, particularly because you still have a modicum of control, what you reveal and what you don't reveal. In my case, I don't have any reservations because I revise my essays a bazillion times. And by the time one ends up on the page, is on the page and ready for publication, it's communicating something that I feel very comfortable with or that I think is important and makes me human and serves the essay. So the, the revelation part is, is just has not been an issue for me. I know it is a very big issue for people who write memoirs and personal essays as well. I also, because I write essays and, and for example, not a longer form memoir, I don't have, say, other characters like my mother or, you know, uh, ex-husband or whatever that will be big parts of the stories that you cannot get around that. And that makes the decision much, much harder when you're revealing other people on the page. That said, you know, you write a personal essay or you write a memoir and it's your truth. And so, um, you know, you should, who else is gonna write your story if you don't, so. I love, I like this genre a lot. Do you run your essays by like Helmet or, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Or, or your daughters that, that do feature, uh, your ex-husband, that yes. do feature. Yes, absolutely. Um, very often the, the strategy for a lot of people who write memoir or personal narratives is run the part that they're in by them, not the whole piece. And they're not the arbiter of whether you can publish it or not. But it's a courtesy. You're still the one who makes the final decision. But you don't want that book out there. And them, they have not been forewarned. What's interesting is very often, for example, um, Liza referenced my boyfriend, Helmut, who is very much featured in a lot of these pieces. And I have to say, I was great, really, greatly relieved. He loves being in the essays. So, so that's good. But absolutely, I run it by them, whether it's just a sentence or the entire essay. Yeah. Okay. Again, though, I'm the one who decides. And I'm not speaking so much for myself as, as a writing teacher of a lot of people who write essays and memoirs. You are the one who gets to decide. Nobody else can kind of green light. I'm not talking about legal issues, but you know, I'm talking about heart issues. So. Oh, okay. And um, so you've published these personal books, personal essays, mm -hmm. and you've also published the two writing books and revised and republished them. How do you switch the voice between them or, or mm -hmm. do you? That's a good question. I don't think I do switch the voices. You know, there's always a, I th I'd be curious if people knew if my, um, my name wasn't on a cover, if they would recognize my voice, because I think it is very similar. The two writing guys are very instructive, but that said, they're written in an essayistic way. They tell a ton of stories and anecdotes to exemplify some of the craft or some of the techniques or some of the um, wisdom garnered from you know, being around hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of writers. So, so in many ways, the style is the same, but there's very much an instructive mm -hmm. quality to those books, whereas this is not about instruction. But the voice, I think, is pretty similar. The voice, the underpinning of humor, perhaps, the storytelling component, because I think storytelling is huge to education. So, mm -hmm. yeah, they're not, they're not that different, voice-wise. <laughs> okay, okay, that's interesting. Other people might feel it's different, for sure, but... So, um, so you're an editor as well as a writer. Mm. Are you harder on yourself than on others? Um, as an editor, I'm absolutely ruthless. I mean, I, 
you know, especially now being a seasoned author, you know what it feels like to have that book on a shelf. I don't want to open it up. And oh, there's the wrong word. Oh, I could have spent another draft on that one, couldn't I? So absolutely. So I build in the time to rewrite and rewrite. I build in the time to revisit something with some distance. I get feedback. I haven't been an editor per se for quite a long time. Um, I used to be a professional editor, but I am a workshop instructor. And so in that sense, because a workshop is about teaching techniques, mm -hmm. you know, I don't pick up a red pen and edit, 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 you know, in the six weeks, the goal is to have that draft get better and better and better and impart a lot of understanding of how to write forward productively to the writer. So I don't have to, I don't have the responsibility mm -hmm. of editing people's work. Um, and if or when I was given that responsibility, yeah, I was, um, why, why let anything go? You know, I mean, at least that's my feeling. So. Who do you turn to for non-toxic feedback? <laughs> yes. yeah, the key is non-toxic, right? Yeah. It depends on what draft I'm on. And, um, and so at the early stages when I'm the most fragile, because you know, so I'm still a really fragile writer, <laughs> then I will definitely get feedback in those nascent stages. But they're from a very select group of friends the primary consideration is that pretty much I'm assured they'll just say, that seems promising, keep going. Okay. And it's weird because while that sounds like it's stroking my ego, and it is, confidence is a huge issue when it comes to writing. For me, the confidence in that front end, and I trust these readers, mm -hmm. and that's often enough. If there's something fundamentally they don't get or see, absolutely. <coughs> in the later stages, the later middle to in drafts, then of course I want somebody who will really pick up that pen and say, I'm confused, or that didn't make sense, or whatever. And so a different read, a different lens. Um, it's funny, I, I used to show my ex-husband my writing and um, in the early stages. And you, know, you want to be careful who you show your writing to. He's a great guy. He's a really good reader. But he's not someone who you know would endorse or say, yeah, I think you've got something here. So he'd be, well, you know, you missed a comma on page seven. And that would be just devastating in those early drafts because I thought, oh, well, if he hasn't said anything about liking it or getting it or whatever, in the back end, he's one of the best readers that I ever okay. had because I don't want to miss a comma. I want all of that to be found. But So you want to mix and match who you get to give people. That's why you don't want to be too precious about it because one of the things I think that can really um, create stagnation is to be too protective of our writing. So you want to get to a group where there's a, a real appreciation for what is on that page as well as constructive criticism. Uh, at least that's the model we try to do in my workshops and the model I try to find when I share my work. So these essays have been written over a period of time. How many iterations does a, an <laughs> essay for, for like a book like this go through? Yeah, um, well, maybe it's all personal, but a ton. I made a joke in one of the writing guides, I don't know which one, but um, where I said, you know, when you're, when you're writing, we all know writing is revising. You should really expect to revise maybe about 40,000 drafts. <laughs> and it's a joke, but it, it wasn't a joke in some ways because I think, for me, the best mindset when you're writing is to think more drafts more quickly. I am somebody who really is about productivity. I believe in finishing things. I think people should finish things. I don't think you don't know. I, I'm someone who knows when something is done. But it helps me to write forward where I just tackle one thing at a time. There's another draft. When I, don't know what I, I, when I don't know what I don't know, I'll just go to another issue. And there's another draft and another. So I go through a lot of drafts to the degree I lose count. Maybe just 40,000. <laughs> but I'm moving it forward more quickly than like, how do I fix this whole thing from this draft to that draft? So um, yeah, these went through a lot. And right through the production phase, because I was so sure they were done. And then you see it in a page proof, you know, not quite as final as this, and you see it differently. Mm -hmm. and, and because I've worked as an editor, because I have that kind of eye, it's funny, it just jumps out, the few things that are still there in the poor production guide, because you're not supposed to change mm -hmm. too much, if anything, other than real mistakes after it's in production or after, you know, you see page proofs and you just, can you change that phrase? And I was careful not to affect pagination or anything, but I was still making changes right through the, the early production phase of the book. So. Mm. But I still feel like when something's done, it's done. And um, so that's a good feeling because I know a lot of writers think, well, I'm just going to let it go. 
And that doesn't feel satisfying to me. I, I can respect that that's how they feel, but I just feel like, well, then I couldn't let it go if I thought there was more to it. I might see something another year later or whatever, but, but I feel good when I let go or say something is done. So how did you select which essays to include in the collection, yeah. uh, assuming with your writing that there were more um, in the file? Definitely there were more. I had a whole aborted book before this that just oh. didn't work in terms of concept. And there's vestiges of it in here. But um, luckily for me, because I was under contract, and um, so I... And, and not a slow writer, but I'm also not a fast writer, and I've talked about how many drafts I put into everything. I didn't have much time to fool around, like, oh, oh, that's too bad, that one didn't work, and that one didn't work. So once I got going on this book, I'd say about 96% of the ones I started ended up being in the book. But yeah, well, if it's not working at some point, it's not, it's difficult to tell if something's not working for me because, in the front end, because when I start an essay, I don't know what it's about. It starts with the smallest little bit of inspiration or an idea, or boy, that bothered me, or I can't let go of that memory. I don't know why it's important. I don't know if it'll resonate with readers. I don't know how to structure it. All I know is it's kind of jumping out at me, and I have written about this. It's one of my favorite things I've ever written about writing, which is called the, an essay called The Church of the Creative Process. So certainly for me, but I think for many writers, there has to be great faith that if you keep exploring on the page something, that draws your attention, it will eventually evolve into something. It will need a lot of massaging and probably reconstituting or whatever, but, but luckily I was able to stay with those stories because I, you know, I almost couldn't afford not to. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, there was something there, but it all had to happen on the page and it had to happen with some real faith that I think I'll figure this out. And so, and then I did. That's interesting, because one of my questions was, um, if you took something irksome and figure out how to respond, or if you write about it to help you process yeah. what it was that was bothering you. So it sounds like you do a little of both. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you take something irksome, and I have to say that often things that annoyed me or irk me or, or people were maybe the seed of something, but I don't think essays that are in the form of rants or just about, this person was obnoxious. Is an, that's not an essay at all. That's not even an anecdote to me. And so it's a fine seed, and it was the seed of several of my pieces, mm -hmm. but that's where that discovery process that for me just only seems to happen when I'm writing or doing my very slow jogs every day. <laughs> it has to get beyond that. Where is the, the point here? What are you trying to learn about yourself, not about them? necessarily, but, or the incident, but about yourself. And so many of them started with that trajectory. This bothered me, but beyond that, it had to go a lot further than that. So, mm -hmm. so, and I did discover things about myself, which is why I love this genre. And of course, when you discover something about yourself, but you bring the story or allow the story to, to show the reader how you kind of evolve through the events, hopefully then it resonates with the reader and they project their own experiences that are similar or have same, similar theme, themes underneath them, you know, when they're reading. So it's as meaningful the, for the reader as for the writer. Yeah. That question came out of the essay that's called Flossom. Oh, yeah. F-L-A-W-S-O-M-E. Yeah. Which deals with being imperfect, and um, I loved your description of an adult temper, temper tantrum. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but um, you'll have to read the, uh, the essay to get back the personification back in sometimes of the adult temper tantrum. But luckily, you know, now it mostly happens inside, you know, between your ears, you know, yeah. whereas as a kid, I was renowned for my temper tantrum, so now I manage to maintain them between my ears. So, um, I don't want to miss this one, but I wanted to ask about your, uh, your, you're a busy person, you're, you, you, you've got your writing workshops and all that. What is your daily practice or your practice of writing? Do you have a certain time that you, sit down and... Um, yes and no. I wish I could say yes, 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 and I did. Writing that, and this book overlapped with the revisions and expanded version of Toxic Feedback, which was right on the heels of Good Naked, so you better believe. And I, and I was teaching more than ever because it was COVID. Oh, right. And so, of course, if there's anything that, good, that came out of COVID, more people picked up a pen. So, um, so it was really busy and I had a really great structure and got more done because I would get up at five and those were precious writing times or reserved writing times. And then when you start, or at least when I start writing in the morning, 
and then I had to stop to teach, and then I had to stop maybe to do some other work, and then I had to, um, but when you start writing in the morning, at least for me, I'm always writing the whole Gets day then. Back in the yeah, it's really, really productive. So um, the habit of writing, and I'm not a writing instructor who says, you have to write every day, but I do think that if you don't engender the habit of writing, it makes your life so much harder. It's, it's just like the body in motion stays in motion. If you kind of have a habit, you're writing every day, even if it's the same time or whatever, just ideas are going to flow more. You're going to pick up where you left off. Things are going to be forming connections or inspirations or aha moments all the time, even when you're far from your desk. So, so yes, yes, yes. The practice of writing, the habit of writing, <coughs> making a point to devote dedicated time to it is so important and served me so well. And then this book came out and summer happened and promoting this book and I've lost that habit, mm -hmm. and so, um, and I have a new book contract, so I have to find it very quickly, and it doesn't feel good that I don't have that habit, but that's the answer, you know, to just, to just engender a habit of writing, and you will make a lot of progress. I think that's true with a lot of creativity. Um, sort of shifting channels a little bit, the, um, a couple of the essays are written in the third person. Yeah. They're written not I, or he or she, they're like, Joni Cole does this, and she thinks that. <laughs> what is the advantage of taking that vantage point? Yeah. When um, the creative well runs dry once in a while, I just need to get away from myself. And I love the traditional essay, and probably two-thirds of these are in the form of a traditional essay. I really incorporated a ton of storytelling in my essay. But, you know, I, this, this happened, this happened, this happened, and this is what I got out of it. But sometimes you just get sick of yourself or <laughs> desperate. And, and I love, I read fiction, I love fiction, I love writing scenes. That's a huge component, obviously, of fiction, also of narrative nonfiction. And once in a while, a character or more a theme, a really important theme would come to me. And I would think it would be better illustrated by um, making up a character who helped me tell that story that communicated something I care deeply about, but it wasn't me as the narrator or the central character. Or sometimes I would use a performative eye where it was me, but let's hope it wasn't too much me. I'm thinking about one called One Day at a Time where the character is a program director of a boutique <laughs> literary festival, of which I was a program director of a boutique. But let's hope I'm not, or didn't behave, Liza can attest No, because she's that. not legally prohibited from getting within 100 yards of the library. Yeah. So she did do some exaggeration. Actually, that's another question I had is, what is the role, when do you bring in exaggeration versus fact or right. reality? Right. Well, certainly in the more traditional form of the essay, there is a saying, truth over facts. You can conflate time a little bit. You can you know, leave somebody out of a, of a scene if they were relevant to, to your truth of it. But you can't make stuff up you know, in the traditional essays, where the others were very clearly, you know, whether you didn't know it in the first paragraph, you knew it pretty quickly, that this is now heightened or greatly exaggerated or simply made up. For example, some are in the, from the point of view of a, of a male character or um, one is in the form of a letter to Vlad the Impaler, so you quickly know. And, um, so if it served in those types of essays, and it did, to heighten or exaggerate something, then I would, because I wasn't trying to fool anybody, I wasn't James frying anybody, but it served the story. I hope it served the comic effect, but it also served the point I was making. But what's oh, I'm so fortunate that the publisher was willing to put those, because they're basically written as fiction almost, but, but they were willing to put it in here because they embodied themes that mattered deeply about, about me. Like the letter to Vlad the Impaler, the theme was very much about my wonder and worry about the origins of cruelty. So while it's in the form of a letter to a dead um, uh, ruler, there was a very important theme to me about it. One that um, is from the point of view of a probably 80 something year old academic in the English department of, I forget the name of it, Walter S. Walters College, all fictitious. But it had a very important thing that mattered <coughs> to me, how in all this wonderful forward movement in bringing in voices that have been marginalized and bringing in new titles to what you know used to be kind of a stale canon, we also still don't want to then kind of reverse roles and exclude people who are still contributing their wisdom. And so, um, 
that was a bit of an experimental essay, but that theme really mattered to me, and so I used a different form to convey it. So in that sense, they are all personal, but some are in more fi fictional forms. Mm -hmm. And then you also used the format of um, Amazon reviews. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and um, what struck me was there's a, a short play that's five mm. pages long. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a screenplay. It's in the, one of the essays is in the form of the screenplay, and it's based on an experience that I had. And I'm one of the characters in this two person screenplay. But I did, it's a really sad, it's, a, it's, it's just a really sad story. And it, the incident plays over in my mind like a movie. And so that's where I thought, well, I will write it then as a screenplay. Mm. And it didn't require um, too many pages because, um, well, you will know if you read the essay, but yeah. that, that felt like, an, what's the expression, form follows essay, or form follows function, function sometimes, yeah. yeah. And so the letter format for that one essay seemed to make the most sense to communicate what I wanted to, and the screenplay um, format seemed to make the most sense in the truth of that essay. And the one essay in the form of all Amazon reviews certainly made my point quickly, I think, in terms of my experience as a writer and, and having some fun with the reality of, of Amazon reviews. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that you search a lot for just the right word. Um, you talk about that in a number of the essays and um, some of your word choices are wonderful. Um, one, one is an essay on eliminating the word was. Okay. And um, I love the word, the dish, I can't say it, disrelish of things royal. Okay. I didn't know that disrelish was a word, but it is. Um, and and you're, you're, uh, at the end of the book, you know how books have acknowledgments at the end? Well, um, uh, Joni's chosen to use the word appreciations. Because, uh, see if I get this right, because acknowledgments are sort of like, I acknowledge I did something wrong. Damn they have God. a negative connotation. So these, this appreciation. So, so it's, um, there's a lot of very careful word crafting. And um, I wonder how your editor or yourself uh, chose to leave in swearing, the F-bomb is in some of the essays. And yeah. that, it, it, it struck me as a, as a, a contrast to um, disrelish. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe it's a difference between internal monologue or, or my interiority, where that F-bomb might be happening a good bit. Or, you know, when I, we were talking about temper tantrums, you know, so my direct dialogue, versus the more expository sections, where I don't talk like that if I'm explaining something or, yeah. Um, or you know, have that more narrative voice, but in my mind, or sometimes in my dialogue, I it certainly will come forth. And it's funny because when you swear in writing, you really um, it it jumps out much more than even in real life, and a little goes a long way. So believe it or not, I I probably did some kind of mathematical look at how often do I use that because if you're going to use it, it better not be invisible the way you you been around people who swear all the time, where it's beginning yeah. to just not hear it at all. And in writing, it's even more so. You can really, really see it. And, you know, I love that Mark Twain quote about the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and lightning bug. And so in those last, hmm. you know, 10,000 drafts, word choice really, really, I think, can, can elevate a piece of writing to make sure it's just the right word. It also has to be words you're comfortable with, you know, but, um, but I am comfortable with those words. Somebody just wrote me a letter, you know, that, or email where it said, really love your essays and your book, and thank you for writing this, and I learned so many new words. <laughs> I just got that letter, that was, that was interesting. That is really interesting. Um, I'm gonna open up, I just wanna ask, um, I'm not even sure how to ask this, but the book has a lot of um, very fine balance between humor and heartbreak. Mm. Their things are funny, but they're and they're poignant. It's not a but; it's an and. Mm. And how do you, when you're writing, work on the balance of that? Because some of these are very um, strongly hard. Yeah. 
topics. Absolutely. And um, that's a great question that I love to practice, you know, doing that, that same thing. I mean, at first it's not calculated at all. Well, I want this right balance of humor and heart. But I think the, the material itself probably starts from something that is emotionally fraught, you, you know, kind of trying to feel at home again in my, um, my family after a divorce, you, you know, but, um, or, you know, or losing somebody or um, missing my father. So most of the stories start from something that has that vibration. And they're not all sad stories, but they're all usually stories with some real emotional potency. Mm -hmm. And, or like, what is the origin of cruelty, which is an essay that started when we were reading headlines in the last administration. And how is this happening? You know, how, how can people be like this? Um, so none of that is funny, but um, then when you're paying attention, both externally, being observant, and when you're paying attention to the thoughts that flow through your head, I think that's where some of the humor comes in. And it has struck me in this book almost as much as in my prior collection of essays. One of the leading bits of feedback or reviews I get is hilarious, laugh out loud funny, roll on the floor funny, you know. And it, it really surprises me mm. because I don't consider myself a humor writer and I'm also not being, you know, you know, purposely coy, but I think the humor is so organic to my observational skills because if you look at the root word of humor and humanity, if you're just paying attention, mm -hmm. we are funny. Not funny jokes, not funny puns, not funny, but just hu humans are funny, the things we do. And, and then if you pay attention internally to the things you are thinking, they just land on the page. And a lot of the humor came just from how I think. And another bit of feedback that there's been some consensus on when I get is, I can't believe you think like that. Or you, you, you have such a weird way, or not weird, but of <laughs> thinking in the world. But it takes me by surprise, but I think that is a lot of the humor, but it's also just the way I think. So again, I'm not conscious of, oh, you're a funny thinker. You know? But you really want to pay attention for all you writers you know, to capture that authenticity, you know, that voice of how you think. Or it, and then also, of course, to be so open to the world around you and the things that, that just just can't help but make you smile. So, um, yeah, so I think some of that came through in the voice. The humor is more the voice. Mm -hmm. The situations are certainly much more dramatic. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope that it, it worked. Um, but I think it certainly speaks to, to who I am, you know. And, of course, we all know that any situation, you know, in Gravitas there's always still something you know, the, the, the candy striper who comes in with, you know, Daffy Duck all over her, her scrubs or whatever, even in a, you know, a difficult hospital situation. Where there's always something that, that I think speaks to our humanity in a, in a lovely way. This is, I hope that my humor never punches down. It's not about mocking people. It's not about mm -hmm. making fun of people. And, and that's where if you start a piece of writing with anger, which often I would, it had to go so far past that. Because mm -hmm. it's just not funny. It's just not funny to make fun of people or whatever. So, um, yeah, it is, a, it is a mix of, or at least I've been told it's a, a real mix of humor and, and poignancy. So. And I think it really works for the essay format. Uh, I do too, yeah. yeah. I hadn't thought about that, but now that you say that, that's really astute, yeah. yeah. So you're all late. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think we're done. I appreciate all these thoughts, and I know my head's spinning. Oh, so wow. thank you so much. I, I appreciate your time and, and the wonderful question. So thank you, and thank you to the setup as well and for coming, especially now that it's darker earlier. I know. Goodness gracious. I know. Really. So, thank you. Okay. And if anybody has questions about you know writing or writing yourselves, I'd love to hear what people are working on and things like that. Thank you to okay. Christian for bringing the books, so feel free to browse. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.